Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Kreis, and I'm a senior content engineer here at Mark Forbes. Uh, I'm joined by Marco Modeski, our marketing specialist, who will be helping run the webinar today. Um, so, as Marco mentioned earlier, if you were uh, if you were on the line a bit early, this is our very first Mark Forge se University seminar, where we'll be teaching you about tips, tricks, and best practices for designing and using our printers. So. Um, this webinar will be a little bit different from your usual. We're going to have some open questions and activities so you can apply some of the tactics I'll be speaking about. Um, we also have some polls um, and some open-ended questions, so please use the chat box to share your thoughts when, uh, when these questions come up. Um, so anyways, let's get started. So today we're going to be covering the basics of effective fiber reinforcement. Um, so first, why is uh, effective fiber routing Im important? Um, basically, effective fiber routing is important because it enables optimized designs for optimized strength. Um, we know that Mark Ford's composite printers print in two types of materials, a plastic matrix and a continuous re reinforcing fiber. And depending on the fiber, you can get a range of different material properties. But the key advantage here, regardless of what material you choose, is that you have granular control over how your part is being reinforced within Iger, um, and layer by layer you control how the fiber paths. So that's how you can sort of optimize the fiber routing for your application. And this granularity of fiber pathing allows you to um, sort of put the fiber where you need it and save cost and print time by reducing fiber usage, only putting fiber in the critical strength areas. Uh, so here you can see a part with continuous strands of fiber laced throughout the perimeter. Um, so this is Kevlar here, uh, strengthening the walls of this part. And uh, while the, the black material is our onyx material, which is formed, which forms what's traditionally known as uh, the matrix of a composite part. So it's a light, tougher material that sort of holds everything together, whereas the fiber is sort of the backbone, the, the skeleton of the part. So putting fiber in the places that will experience the most force is the key to optimizing the strength of your parts. Um, so here's basically what we'll be learning today. I'll start out with an introduction to beam bending theory and build on that to show how continuous fiber strengthens a part. Then we'll work through the two types of fiber reinforcement and how you can use each one of them to reinforce parts in different ways. And by the end of this, you should be able to take these techniques and apply them to your own parts. Um, but first, I'm gonna give you a minute to answer the following questions to get a sense of where everyone stands in terms of um, using and designing for our printers and using fiber during prints. Um, so we're launching the poll now. And so just uh, fill that out and we'll wait about a minute. And for those of you who just uh, to, who just joined, uh, we're having a poll about about your background. We're getting a couple more answers filtering in, so we'll give it about thirty more seconds. I think ten issues. Okay. okay. Right. Great. Um, we're going to end the poll now. Um, so, what it looks like is. Um, a lot of people have here, I can share the results here. Uh, a lot of people have an engineering background. Um, uh, usually people use uh, continuous fiber in about 25% of, uh, of the prints and the priority when reinforcing is, um, is strength. Um, but we have a smattering of other answers around, but I think, thank you everyone for answering. And so now we're gonna get uh, started on um, on beam bending theory. 
so now we're going to switch to uh, to a demo where I'm going to be talking about um, the key factors for effective fiber reinforcement. All right, we good to go? Yeah, I think we have video. Okay, great. And can you move the mouse over to the? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, so there are basically two key factors for effective fiber reinforcement. Um, the first one is that fibers like being loaded in tension. So um, fiber, I sort of compare fiber to a piece of raw spaghetti, which I have here. Um, if I bend it, then um, it snaps really easily. If I try to come, whoops, <laughs> if I try to compress it, it also snaps. But if I load it in tension, it can actually hold uh, a fair amount of force. And that's very similar to the way that uh, that fibers are set up. Uh, everything that traditional composite manufacturers do when working with fibers is intended to make the most use of that tensile strength in the fiber. And that's really how you want to be thinking about uh, where you're putting fiber in your parts. Um, so the next factor of fiber reinforcement is based upon beam bending theory. So I'm going to draw a beam on the board. And here's a wall. We have a beam attached to that wall. And we're going to be, let me switch markers here. Um, we're going to be applying a load to that beam at the end. So it's sort of like, uh, here, let me draw this a bit darker. Um, so it's, it's sort of like a, a diving board. Um, so when we applied load to that beam, the forces basically resolve into tensile and compressive forces. So if the load is going this way, then um, what ends up happening is that these surfaces get loaded in tension, and this, this top surface is basically getting pulled apart, and this bottom surface is loaded in compression. Um, and, and the switch between tension and compression happens along the neutral axis of a beam. Um, this may be familiar from a statics class uh, or, um, or a structures class. Uh, so this is just sort of the basic foundation of, um, of where composites theory comes from. Um, and so basically what we can say is that any material that is uh, any material that is below the neutral axis is going to be loaded in compression. And any material that is above this neutral axis is going to be loaded in tension. And the tensile force is where the fibers come into play. Um, so when you have a beam that, um, uh, yeah, I, I said this already, but when you have a beam that, uh, the, the, the extremes of the beam are what sort of get loaded the most. They take on the most force. Um, and if reversed, if we applied that load uh, up instead of down, then um, the bottom experiences tension and the top experiences compression. So that's why um, basically the, the key point here is that the extremes experience the most force and those are the portions of the beam that you want to reinforce more than other sections of the part. So, uh, so when you have a weight or a material constraint, beams often take shapes like, uh, like tubes or boxes, uh, where you have, if you have, let's go here, um, if you have a tube, only the outside of, uh, of basically the, the tube, only the outside has material, right? Uh, if you have an I-beam like you'd see in construction, you're only putting material on the top and the bottom. And if you have a T-beam, you're only putting material on the top. Um, and the, the reason for these sort of three types of beams is that um, it's all based on the loading conditions. For a tube, it can it is able to take loads from any direction. For an I-beam, it's able to take loads. So, uh, whoops. A tube can take those sort of bending loads from any direction. A fiber, uh, sorry, um, an I-beam 
um, can resist bending sort of in this vertical, uh, vertical plane. And a T-beam can resist bending only in, in this direction. And so when you have a, a weight constraint or a material, material constraint in construction, uh, you use usually these three types of beams depending upon your load. So if you know that you're only getting load from this direction, then a T-beam will be the most effective use of material and, um, and strengthen your part in the sort of best way possible. If you know that it, you may get forces from both directions up and down, then you use an I-beam from all around, then, uh, then a tube is, um, is useful. So, um, so, so again, it's the extremes of the beam that are important. Um, and as the beam gets thicker, um, having more material on, uh, sorry, as the beams get thicker, um, material on the extremes has more of an impact. So a really tall beam with the same amount of material on the top and bottom, um, the, the same amount of material on the top and bottom of a very tall beam will have a much larger impact than that same material on the top and bottom of a very short beam. Um, and we can demonstrate this pretty easily. So uh, let's zoom in right here. Okay. So basically here I have a bunch of bricks and a bunch of plates. Um, so if I take one of one or two of these plate pieces um, and I, let's take this one because it's a bit longer. Um, if I take one of these plate pieces and I apply this load to them, then you can see it, is, it bends and it snaps. So this piece is not strong enough to hold that load. If I take basically a beam made out of these bricks that are all sort of separate pieces and I apply a load to them, then it also snaps. But if I take another one of these beams and I put these continuous plates above and below that beam, and I apply that same amount of load, then it holds. Um, so, so, so basically uh, the, the panels on the top and the bottom make that part stronger. Um, so so what, what, it, what do all of you think about, uh, about why that is? I, I sort of talked about beam bending theory. Um, and uh, here, let's go back here. I'm just going to look at some of the comments. Um, so uh, basically what the, the plates are doing is that they're, oh, I'll go back here. Uh, um, what the plates are doing is that they're providing sort of continuous uninterrupted strength across the uh, critical extreme surfaces of the part. So while a single plate couldn't support that load, when we space them out uh, on the top and bottom surfaces of that beam, they, um, they can hold a much larger force. Um, and that sort of segues us very well into composites theory. Uh, can we go back to the slides? Okay. Yep. Um, or no, to the there. OK. Um, so you don't need to make an entire beam out of these plate pieces um, because, and, and likewise out of composites because, or sorry, out of fibers because that would make a very expensive and a um, very fiber heavy part. Um, so you build a sandwich panel that has a core matrix material that doesn't need to be as strong. And all you need to do is put the fibers, which is the stronger material, on the extremes of your loading surfaces, on the extremes of that beam. And with that methodology, we can reinforce the composite printed parts um, effectively. So you don't need to pack the whole beam, you just need the, the extreme surfaces. Okay, so now let's go back to slides. Okay. Um, so we're going to go back to the computer and we're going to work through how this applies to the composite 3D printing process with continuous fiber. Oops. So as I mentioned earlier, our software gives you the power to reinforce with 
continuous strands of composite fibers selectively. So you can control how your fiber is laid down on a layer by layer basis. And in each layer or group of layers, you have two options for reinforcement. You have concentric fill and isotropic fill. Um, simply put, concentric fill reinforces the walls of a part. You can see here, this, uh, this blue is, uh, is the fiber and the gray is the infill on the walls. Um, so concentric fill just reinforces these walls of the part, whereas isotropic fill um, essentially reinforces planes normal to the build plate as the part builds up. Um, with concentric fill though, you can control the number of concentric fiber rings that you use to reinforce your part. So in this case, we're using two rings here. Um, and you can also choose to reinforce just inner holes or just outer walls or both. Um, isotropic fill over here, it simulates the isotropic weave of a more traditional composite where you have a sheet of Kevlar or carbon fiber. Um, oh, and so we're, we're getting some, uh, some questions in. So um, what does reinforce in the walls mean? So I talked a little bit earlier with, uh, with the bricks about how, um, about how reinforcing the extremes of the part will, uh, is sort of the, the best use of, of your fibers. We'll go into this a little bit more later, but essentially depending upon your loading condition, reinforcing the walls may be the extremes of your loading force, uh, the, the extreme surfaces experiencing load. But in other cases, it may be these panels. Um, so, uh, so here in isotropic fill, uh, you see this zigzag back and forth across the part. Um, basically, if you were to select a group of layers in Iger to reinforce with isotropic fill, this zigzag would rotate by 45 degrees each layer um, to make the strength even in all directions on this plane. Um, so these reinforcement options can be applied to individual layers or to groups of layers. Um, so going back to how the beams experience, beams experience most load on their extremes, we can use these two tools to do that, um, to make reinforcing panels like we saw with, with the bricks. Um, so with concentric fill, we can reinforce the sides of a part. And with isotropic fill, we can reinforce uh, the top and bottom by construction, constructing these types of panels. Okay, so now we're gonna go into an Iger demo. So first, we're just gonna take a basic beam. And uh, we're just gonna start with the basics. So say I want to reinforce this part um, from bending in this orientation where we have an applied load on, uh, on one of these beams and maybe it, it's fixed over here. Uh, what kind of reinforcement strategy would I use to apply to this, uh, to this beam to reinforce it effectively for that one? And remember, feel free to use the chat box to, uh, to sort of post your thoughts. All right. Um, yeah. So we're getting a few uh, uh, a few good comments in here. Um, people are saying yes. We want to reinforce the top and the bottom of the beam because if we get a load here, then that will get uh, then the the top plane will be loaded in tension, and if we get a load from down here, then the bottom plane will be reinforced in tension. So we can go into our reinforcement settings. We can select isotropic fiber. Um, and go into internal view. And you can see here we have those panels on the top and bottom of the part. And so that's a good way to reinforce for that, uh, for that bending. So um, I talked a little bit earlier about that zigzag pattern um, in isotropic fill that you can see alternating here. Um, and what we really want to do is make sure that we load the fibers as much in tension as possible. So if we have in this part, um, if we have the load sort of being applied here, if the beam is fixed over here, then all that force is going to want to, is sort of being applied across this section. Um, 
So let me go up to one of these layers. So if we have, um, if we have a layer like this, all the fibers are running up and down this way. But the force is really bending this beam sort of across this face this way. Um, and so what we can do is we can change this fiber angle over here to zero degrees. And that will align all of the fibers across the loading surface in the direction that we want. Um, so usually isotropic fill, we can go up to this, this panel here. Usually it sort of alternates between different, uh, different rotations. And, um, oh, and someone is posting a question about navigating up and down in the part. Um, so I just want to show you here. This is an internal view. I can look at the part in 3D. Um, and I can go to 2D here. And I can click on a specific layer and just use the arrow keys to move up and down to look at each layer. Um, so the zigzag patterns here are usually used to reinforce the part sort of evenly distributed in all directions. But for this loading condition, we really just want it, um, uh, we just want it sort of back and forth uh, across this loading surface. Um, so now the fibers, and, and we can do that within a group as well. So if I go to 3D view, I can select this group and I can say that these fiber angles, this is that rotation I was talking about, I only want them to be zero. And it will change that group so that all of the fibers, I have all the fibers in this part once this is done slicing, um, running back and forth across, um, uh, across this beam surface. So we're gonna exit out, um, whoops, actually we're gonna, I'm gonna revert this part and I'm going to go back to part view. Um, so now we're gonna think of, look at a different loading case. So instead of loading the beam sort of on this plane here going sort of up and down in these directions, uh, we're gonna look at it from this view. Um, so say that we have, now the beam is again fixed here and we have loads coming in from right here or right here, pressing the beam. Um, what kind of, uh, of reinforcement strategy would we use, uh, would we use here? Um, yeah, so we have a, a few comments coming in. We're gonna use concentric fill. Um, so actually that's a good point. Someone suggested we could rotate the, the beam and do another sandwich panel. Um, but here we can actually just use concentric fill. So I'm gonna change the reinforcement settings to concentric fill and I'm going to uh, put it on all layers. Uh, Christopher, I, I think uh, we see your question here on optimal number of layers. I think we're gonna touch upon that later in the webinar. All right, so now we can go into internal view. And now we can see those concentric rings are sort of on every layer lining the part. And so that effectively creates a sandwich panel between this top face and this bottom face. Um, and one thing we can do with concentric fibers is we can increase the number of concentric fiber rings here. Um, and that will make your part generally stronger bit by bit as we increase those, uh, that number of concentric rings. Um, but there are diminishing returns as new rings get added because each is a bit closer to the center of the part to the neutral axis than the one previous. Um, and the same is true for isotropic panels. If you make your fiber groups thicker, they're going to be stronger, but because each additional layer is closer to the center of the part, um, it adds less to the overall strength than the last because it's closer to the core. So, um, so that's sort of how, uh, how we can think about um, basically just trying to get fiber on the, the outside of your part. Um, 
so now let's go back to the to the part um, sort of on the outside. And, and with concentric fill, you may not need to use uh, fiber all the way up and down the part. You could put concentric fill sort of uh, every, every couple layers in certain fiber groups. So say I don't want this uh, sort of in this, this entire area. I just want select areas. Uh, I can make specific groups of concentric fill up the part um, depending upon the strength needs. Um, so now we're going to go back back out to part view. Um, and so now, uh, basically with this beam, uh, we've sort of experienced the two different types of loading, the, the sort of the two directions of loading conditions. Um, but uh, basically, what if we didn't quite know what direction this beam would be loaded in? Um, if it may be bent in any direction? Um, what do all of you think about... Uh, about what we, what we could do in that case. Oh, and we have a question, a good question about what's the minimum number of layers from the top and bottom that you should place fiber. Um, so Iger will automatically place fiber uh, four layers above the bottom layer and uh, and four layers below the roof layers because the, that roof and that floor are um, are sort of essential to the the plastic element of the part um, to sort of hold everything in as the matrix. Um, so usually I'll go, if there's any sort of roof layer, I'll go four layers below and that's the extreme of the part. Um, so now we're going uh, to reinforce this for sort of all different loading conditions. Um, we want to do both isotropic and concentric fibers as, uh, as some people have said. So we're going to go into internal view again, uh, or actually I'm going to go back out here I'm going to turn off preserve custom fiber and go back to um, isotropic fiber here. And so this is going to take a minute to slice. So now we can go into internal view. Uh, we see we have our sandwich panel and basically what we can do here is we can just click the center uh, The center group that doesn't have any fiber hit use fiber and change that to concentric fill um, And then it will uh, it'll slice with uh, with that fill setting um, and uh, Again, this is this is this is basically what we call uh, shelling your part where you're creating basically a, a box that is the shape of your part just shelled with fiber. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've talked with a couple, a couple people who say, you know, like, oh, why don't you just put fiber, put isotropic fill fiber throughout the entire thing. Um, and I actually, I sliced this beam with, uh, with fiber and um, it basically ends up being about $400 in materials. Um, with again diminishing strength returns because the fiber inside of the um, inside of the part. Let me actually show you while this is slicing, uh, so I can go back. Oh, this is this is still slicing, but um, oh, actually, uh, it's slicing with isotropic fill. But um, let's see. This may take a little bit. Um, so This is, it uh, looks like it's slicing with full isotropic fill first, but I made the changes after that. So it'll, it'll uh, go back to concentric. So hopefully this won't take long. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so th this process in general is, is called shelling. Um, so basically in the shelling process, I sort of go through it in a couple steps. Um, first, if I, if I have a generic part that I'd like to shell, um, the first thing that I do is I put um, I put isotropic panels on all of on the top and bottom surfaces and any sort of large geometry changes within the part. Um, and then between all of those isotropic panels, I'll use uh, concentric fill, um, and that will fill in sort of the rest of the the areas where there may be any sort of side loads on the part. Um, looks like this is taking a while. 
Um, so we're having a couple questions about uh, sort of FEA. Uh, right now we don't currently have um, sort of an, uh, an FEA package available for our parts, unfortunately. So um, uh, there's not really a good, in, in general with composite fibers, there's not really a great way to, uh, to sort of simulate them because you have all these different sort of strings uh, or fibers running back and forth across the part. Um, but uh, that's definitely a good point. But in, in general, we basically, if you're shelling your part, if you're putting your part on the extremes, that's where you're going to get the most load. Um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the reinforcement strategies, it's just sort of um, usually for most applications, I can end up using, um, using uh, like four to six layers of isotropic panels um, and uh, on, on each sort of, on each loading surface and then uh, two to four rings of concentric fibers. So that's usually a good rule of thumb for, um, for most applications that require, uh, that require high strength. Um, that's usually what I go for. Um, if you're really, really concerned about strength, um, then I'd, I'd bump it up. But right now it's, it's kind of trial and error. Um, a good question came in about uh, does adding or not adding fiber reinforcement help or hurt part warping? Um, that's a really good question. Um, fiber reinforcement, uh, as I said earlier, um, fiber reinforcement sort of, uh, you're adding a, essentially a stiff section of your part to the top and to the bottom. Um, and if you're having issues with your part warping, um, that stiff section on the bottom layer will essentially, will essentially force your part to remain flat and remain rigid during the print. Um, so that's one way that that sort of warping can be uh, avoided is putting a sandwich panel in. Um, but because of, uh, you don't wanna put just fiber on the bottom layer, you actually want an even sandwich panel because the part may, um, may bend up if you just have sort of one panel on the bottom of your part or something like that because of that sort of T-beam um, uh, sort of workflow of only having one panel of fiber means that your part can bend easily in one direction and not bend easily in another direction. All right, so um, here we have this part finally slicing for concentric. Uh, sorry about the wait. Um, someone was asking about advantages and disadvantages of the different fill pattern styles. Um, so in, in general, how I sort of frame it is this. A, lo a lot of the fill pattern styles are in the same order of magnitude of strength, um, but the fill pattern will not generally affect part strength when you get to you working with fibers because the fibers add so much more strength. They're, you know, 10, 20 times stronger with fiber reinforcement. So um, at that point, the infill geometry is not going to have as much of an effect um, because the fiber is the dominant uh, strong material. Um, so now we can, we can look at this part. Uh, this, this now is an effectively shelled part where we have isotropic panels on the bottom. We have concentric rings in the middle. We only use about 22 cubic centimeters of carbon fiber. Um, and I actually, I did this when I sliced the entire thing with, um, with full isotropic fill. It used almost a full large spool of, of carbon fiber, about 100, 150 cubic centimeters. So it was just uh, interesting to see that, you know, this part has roughly the same amount of strength as a part totally packed with fiber, but it's much less material. Um, so now let's go back to, uh, to some other parts. So let's go here. And um, now we're actually gonna look into some sort of concrete examples. Uh, so here we have um, a gripper jaw. Um, this gripper jaw, it holds a coupling right here on these surfaces um, and it's bolted to a robotic arm, uh, an end effector uh, through these holes. So, um, so given, uh, given that sort of uh, loading condition where it's, uh, 
is sort of gripping a part, uh, what kinds of uh, reinforcement strategies would, would you want to implement on a part like this? Um, and, and also, uh, while, while people are responding, there are a couple other questions that come in about minimum thickness for, um, for different types of fiber, like what's the minimum thickness that you can reinforce. Uh, we actually have a composites design guide that teaches a lot of those uh, sort of numbers and, and what kinds of things you need to know uh, to design for fiber. And that's something that we can probably send out uh, after the webinar. Yes. Right? Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So, so back to this part here. Uh, where would people want to put fiber to, um, to reinforce this part? So we have a, a couple of comments coming in about uh, concentric fill. Um, so that's, that's exactly right. Basically, because the load is coming from this direction when it's gripping around that, um, that uh, it's sort of coming around that part. Uh, we actually did get a good question about why the build orientation for the gripper jaw. Um, so this is actually pretty simple. If we oriented it like this, then the part is going to be gripping the pipe coupling here. And um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with 3D printing. The parts aren't going to be isotropic because they're built up layer by layer. So the parts can tend to shear along layer lines. So if this gripper jaw gripped uh, a pipe coupling here, then it has the potential to shear right here. And so that's why we don't want to print it in that orientation um, because uh, the part may grip the coupling and then the top of the jaw may shear off. So we want to choose this orientation um, because there's not as high of a tendency for shear right here. One, because of the orientation and the matrix material, the onyx, is traveling along sort of the, the cross section of the part, um, but also because we can reinforce the fiber that way. Um, so we want to do, uh, we want to do uh, we're going to use Kevlar for this case because Kevlar is a very impact resistant material. Um, and this gripper jaw is going to, um, this gripper jaw is going to be sort of repeatedly gripping and ungripping um, couplings on, you know, on this manufacturing line. So, um, so Kevlar in, in general is a, a good material for these sorts of applications where there's repeated impacts. Uh, usually what I tell people is uh, carbon fiber is very good for sort of constant loading situations where you just need a part to be strong. It doesn't, it's not going to flex that much. It's under a constant load. Um, fiberglass is very good for intermittent loads. So it, it's a bit tougher than carbon fiber, um, but it can take sort of um, uh, sort of many, many loads um, sort of in sequentially. Um, and then uh, Kevlar is very good for sort of impact loads where you're like rapidly closing around a jaw or you're getting, it's getting hit with a hammer or, or something like that. Um, so here we have the concentric fill of the part and you can see that these surfaces, the critical ones are the ones getting loaded. Um, and you can also see here, um, so, uh, oh, so a good question came in about how Kevlar is, is impact resistant, but uh, it's the onyx that is in contact with the force. Uh, so how does that work? Um, basically, it's all about sort of force distribution. So the, the onyx is the, the thing that's directly in contact with the material, and the onyx may see some wear. But what ends up happening is that the force gets, the force distributes into the fiber. And because the fiber is a continuous strand, it distributes, the force distributes along, around the length of the strand. Um, so onyx is sort of just um, holding everything together, but the, the fiber is providing that backbone um, that distributes the force along the entire, um, the entire area. So it's sort of like, um, uh, it, it's sort of basically like, um, what's a good analogy? Um, I sort of describe it sort of like um, like a skeleton and, and, and like skin. Your skin is sort of your, your external um, surface, but your, your bones are what provide structure and what provide resistance um, to any forces. And, um, and 
they sort of distribute the force along the length of the bone to, um, you know, if, if something happens. Um, so uh, someone asks about if, uh, if a shell or a sandwich panel is still a good choice. Um, so we, we basically, we, we want to use a shell here because, um, uh, again, because, because of that distribution. If, if the part was oriented differently, if the impact was being sort of loaded here, then we probably would want to use a sandwich panel. Um, but uh, again, it, it sort of, this is all tied into part orientation and, and part design. All right, so now we're going to go on to our next example. Um, which is this sort of alignment bracket right here. Um, so this is going to be supporting a weight that um, that sort of gets dropped down onto these, uh, that, that gets bolted into these these holes over here um, and aligned on these these pins. So um, so uh, what kind of what sort of surfaces are are important here? All right. Um, so we have some some comments coming in about uh, the top and bottom surfaces. Um, it's important to note that because this isn't a symmetrical part, uh, there's you know there's this surface and there's also this surface over here. Um, so what we actually want to uh, that some people are talking about is what we actually want to reinforce is specifically this section of the beam because that's the thing that's going to be loaded. Um, and uh, um, if we go into inter internal view, then um, then we can do that. So we want to reinforce let's see four layers here with isotropic fiber, and we're going to create that fiber group. And then um, while that's happening, I'm going to go ahead and find out where that top surface of that part is. Um, so we can see this is, um, this is the top surface of that, the small sort of fingers here. And we want to find the layer in which the infill comes, comes in, which is, which is here. So that's layer 76. So I'm going to there we go, make this group and make it end at layer 76, four layers before that roof, and create that group there. Um, and uh, actually someone, someone brought up a good point, which is that um, sometimes in, in a design like this, um, it is, um, it's tricky to prevent shear. So once we go back into, um, once, once this slices, we can go back into 3D view and I can, I can show you what, I'm, what we're talking about. Um, so let me get it out. So we have this part here. Uh, we have these panels here and here. Um, but one, one thing that could happen is that this part is sort of loaded here and it delaminates and breaks away from the upper section of the part because of the loading conditions. Um, that, that's a very good point. Um, one thing that, that we suggest and that someone actually suggested in the chat is you can put bolt holes through your part, uh, just like this here and, and right here. And um, essentially you put a bolt hole maybe with a flathead bolt and a heat set insert or a nut on the bottom face and you tighten those down and that will compress all of the Z layers and prevent them from delaminating. Um, and if you reinforce those bolt holes with continuous, uh, with, with, with concentric fill, um, then uh, basically the force from the bolt gets distributed amongst the fibers um, and any, any load that's trying to shear the part or delaminate the part in the Z direction will, um, will distribute to the bolt and the fibers surrounding it. Um, so the bolt, basically, um, the bolt is resisting any tensile forces. So in order to split the part up, if you had a bolt here and a bolt here, you'd have to break all of the bolts and all the threads in order to do that. Um, so we're going to go back to the 2D view of the uh, continuous fibers here. And so again, we have a panel on the bottom. And then we're going to go sort of up these fingers. And we have a panel sort of on the top of the fingers. 
and then it's empty from there on out. If I wanted to fully shell this part, say I were taking impacts sort of here and here, then I could create um, a panel up here. Um, and what I'm also going to do is create a concentric group here, which I'll explain a bit about later. Um, and we'll, we'll wait for this to load. So here we have isotropic fiber. Um, And then I'm going to draw this one out. Oops, that was too far. And then I'm also going to add concentric fiber here. And so what we're doing now is sort of what I was talking about with the, just with the flat beam before is, is we're shelling this part. Um, and uh, what you'll see once, uh, once this sort of starts slicing, we can check it out here is that uh, these bolt holes will start to be um, will start to be reinforced and um, that sort of resists the, the the fiber the stack of fiber the eventually a tube of fiber will form around the bolt hole and that will mean that when you're sort of bolting through the part that tube of fiber is um, is supporting that that bolt and distributing the the sort of compressive clamping force um, and again, as I said, that bolt will resist loading in the Z direction, um, any, any tensile loads, because um, it's essentially pulling all of the layers together and compressing them. Uh, so any shear forces, if, if, this, if these fingers end up delaminating here, um, having a bolt through certain, certain areas of your part will, um, will prevent that uh, that delamination. So that's that's one trick that we use here to um, to improve the strength of our parts in the z direction. Um, would uh, so there's a, a question coming up about uh, routing a path through a part for fiber uh, to populate using the concentric fill be a good way to control force flow within a part. Um, so that's actually a really great idea. I don't have an example of it right now, but um, but basically what you can do is if you want the fiber to flow in a specific direction of your part, say you do some FEA on a part and you realize, you know, where a specific load path is propagating. If you put a feature in that part, basically creating a rib or, um, yeah, creating a rib or, or sort of speed holes in a specific area, and then you use concentric fill, you can, um, so, so say we knew that the, the loading of this part was sort of, propagating through here and going around here. Um, you can use concentric fill to uh, sort of reinforce the areas around the ribs um, in order to put fiber along the load path. So that's, that's actually a really good idea. Um, so again, there's, there's all these tricks to using the fiber intelligently to uh, route around your loading surfaces. And, and really the, the, the key takeaways here are that um, your largest, uh, the like beams are gonna experience the largest loads at the sort of extreme faces of a part. Uh, so here we have our part fully filled and you can see uh, within here, you can see that tube filling up that bolt hole. Uh, so we're gonna save this part. Um, we're actually gonna go back to the presentation. Um, and yeah, so, so the key takeaway is really, you know, when you're designing your part, uh, looking, look at where those critical loading surfaces are and use the fibers to reinforce those surfaces on the sort of extreme faces of, of, of where the loads are. So the loads can usually be, um, be identified as bending forces that can then resolve as tensile and compressive forces. So using isotropic fill on sort of top and bottom planes and concentric fill on, on the sides of your part will reinforce the extreme bending surfaces of that part and uh, put fiber where, um, where those surfaces are. And, um, and yeah, so, so those are sort of the key, the key elements to effective reinforcement. Um, identifying where your fibers are loaded in tension and using that background of beam bending theory to uh, 
uh, to infer where, where fiber can be put in your part. All right, so that's the end of the presentation today. Um, so um, if anyone has any further questions, I'll, have, I'll be happy to stay around for a minute to, uh, to answer any of them. Um, uh, we have been recording today's webinar, so if, sorry, let me get up to the microphone. Uh, we have been recording today's webinar, so uh, if you'd like to refer to this in the future, we're just going to uh, take uh, tonight to process it and put it on the website, and we'll be sending out a link to the recording sometime tomorrow morning, uh, as well as a uh, link to the uh, composites design guide, as Alex mentioned earlier. All right, so we're getting a, um, uh, a couple of questions in. Um, do groups of isotropic fill have a certain number of layers of onyx between them? Um, so basically, if you have just a, spe a specific group of fiber, I can go to 2D view here, there's not going to be any onyx between each surface. But if, if you create a sandwich panel, then like if this, if this were empty, if I turned off fiber here, um, then that number of layers, that, that's something that you can specify and that's totally up to your part geometry. Um, so uh, some other questions. Um, is it possible to specify a fiber keep out region to have an area that's flexible? Um, so that's something that, that's a little bit interesting. It sort of goes back to the strengthening certain areas question that we got before. Um, which is basically that you can sort of, if you design your part with specific pockets or ribs or, or things like that, um, and you use the different types of concentric fill, so you use all walls or, uh, or inner holes. So like say I, I didn't want reinforcement around these holes, I wanted them to be a little bit more flexible, then I could do outer shell only. Um, so it's, it's not a perfect solution to that, but it, it's really about thinking about the design and creating sections that you, you don't want to reinforce. You can also do things like, um, like uh, if you want a specifically very, so Onyx isn't entirely flexible. Um, if you want a specific like flexural element, you can design that part, that portion of your part to be less than the minimum uh, thickness required for fiber reinforcement. So I believe that's, um, depending upon the geometry, this is all actually specified in the design guide. Um, it's 2.9 millimeters or 3.8 millimeters, something like that, or 2.8 and 3.6 millimeters. So if you design parts that have a section that is less than that amount thick, then um, the fiber can't get through it. So then that part will be more flexible. Um, I have a couple other questions about the different types of fibers when it's appropriate to use different types of fibers. Um, so uh, we have actually a great question about, um, about that. So, so basically we, one, one fiber that I didn't mention is our uh, heat resistant fiber uh, called HSHT. It's a, it's a fiberglass. Um, so when we talk about HSHT, it's not about the, maximum melting point of that material. It's about the, um, the heat deflection temperature. So at what temperature does the, uh, does the material lose, start to lose strength? So for materials like carbon fiber or Kevlar, uh, just because of the way that we print with them, um, they lose strength at a certain temperature and high strength, high temperature fiberglass loses strength at a higher temperature that is still below the melting point of onyx. Um, but what that basically means is if you have a high temperature application, that backbone of your part that makes that, that is HSHC, the, the high temperature fiberglass, that will stay strong at higher temperatures than, um, than just sort of your regular fiberglass, just because of how the material works. Um, so we have, um, can you please explain, uh, re-explain uh, in an example using an external metal rod or inserts to reinforce a part? Um, so uh, this is, uh, let's see, let me go back to, so I don't have a good example of this in Iger, but um, let's see if I can, if I can show it here. Um, 
So, so basically the, the issue with this part, as I described before, is that if you put a load here, um, just because parts are built up layer by layer and you can't connect parts, uh, you, can't, you can't have fiber sort of routing vertically in your part. Uh, right here is a potential failure area in the part because the only thing that's holding it together is the adhesion force of one, onyx, one layer of onyx and fiber to another layer of onyx and fiber. So it's basically like if you laid down a layer of hot glue and then on top of that, you laid down another layer of hot, hot glue and you tried to pull those two layers apart, that, um, that the bond between the two layers of hot glue is weaker than the bond between sort of a continuous bead of hot glue if you were to pull along the length of a, a, of a bead. Um, and that because the layers are weaker, if you have a load here, it may, you may not start to see a split here. So what you could do to avoid that split, maybe this part would be designed differently. Maybe this would be uh, sort of, instead of having this, this draft angle here, it'll go straight up and across. But then you could put a bolt hole that goes all the way through all of the layers. And basically you can sort of view this as two separate sections. You have this section up here and these, this finger section down here and the bolt will hold those two sections together. So in order to break the two sections, you need to have to break the bolt or pull, if you have a nut on the bottom here, you need to like, in order to break it, you need to, or in order to break the bond between, you know, this section and this section, instead of only relying on that adhesion force, you're now relying on the force of the, the bolt clamping those two sections of the part together. And that's a lot, a much stronger force because you're, you're using, you know, metal, um, using a metal bolt and, and metal threads. And especially with an, like a, a lock knot or something on the other side, in order to separate these two pieces now, instead of just pulling them apart, you have to pull the nut through all these layers of fiber to, uh, to get it uh, to, to break the joint, or you have to break the threads of the bolt, which is a lot stronger than, than the adhesion between the two layers. Um, and, and, you know, someone else is also mentioning shear pins are also a good, um, a, a good way to do that, shear pins instead of bolts. Um, um, I'm just looking through some other questions. Um, um, so someone mentioned, you know, part like this, you could print it on the side with a few layers of, of isotropic uh, throughout the height. Um, I think that's what they're saying. Um, uh, again, sort of one thing that I always recommend in terms of designing is when you're designing your part, when you're modifying your part, think about uh, what would be a good surface to print it on um, at the beginning of your design process. Um, this is relevant in all aspects of, of manufacturing. Uh, you don't want to design a poor, um, you don't want to design a part that is a poor fit for your manufacturing application. So just with composites 3D printing, the, the design for manufacturing methodology still stands is really thinking critically about what surfaces are gonna be loaded while you're designing your parts. What are the key features where like, if you have this hole, do you wanna print this hole vertically or horizontally? What are the critical features? And, um, and where you're gonna need reinforcement and then using that to develop a good, um, build orientation and uh, reinforcement strategy. So it all stems from the design. Uh, so when you're thinking about your part design or your application, just remember that um, to think about what would be a good orientation for your part to be in um, for it to be successful. Um, all right, looks like we have, um, that, that's it for today. Um, thank you all for attending and um, as Marco said, we'll be sending some stuff out later.
So I'm going to transition to Marco. Yep. So uh, we're going to make sure to follow up with an email with a link to the on-demand recording of today's webinar, as well as a link to the design guide that uh, Alex had mentioned earlier. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, we loved having the discussion in the in the chat. That was kind of the goal of today's uh, seminar. Uh, and we're uh, ramping up these kinds of things. So we're hoping to have more discussions like this in the future. Uh, tomorrow's email with the follow-up, I'll actually uh, try to send that out from my personal email address uh, or my personal work email address so that uh, if you have any feedback, please do let us know. Um, whether that's feedback on today's presentation or uh, things that you'd like to see in the future. Uh, we can actually, uh, we're very, we want to be receptive to your feedback. We want to hear what you folks want to learn about so that we can actually put together these uh, seminars uh, in response to uh, uh, what, what you folks want to learn about, what you want to uh, learn more about, um, and have that discussion and community going. Uh, so again, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.